பாஸ்கரன் பாஸ்கரன் sir can can you hear me now yeah i could able to hear but uh, how to share my slides actually there is no share screen available but uh, there is sir uh, sir can you see for any share screen option no i could not able to see anything actually the zoom uh, sir the share screen was not there sir ரைட் <laughs> 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 yeah yeah up white board so uh, white box with an arrow mark yeah. in, in that actually you have to click it yeah. you have to click your entire screen start start white board eh? start white board. more options white board full screen apply visual effects use a phone for audio open Now, yeah, right. now can you start, sir? Now, wait for the screen on the chart. Jam file with the meeting, yes. Yes. Uh, sir, you are going to screen and click. Uh, that screen will be visible uh, please select that screen and share oh. my, my slides are visible eh ah uh, uh, sir you have to click on the share index screen click eh on the link and the other page that you can click the my size are visible no no not it not it the once i click a white board i am getting start new white board open a jam zoom la da or what 
வரும் <laughs> <laughs> ஆடியோ <laughs> 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 வருதாங்க <laughs> <laughs> ஆ நல்லா இருக்கு சரி சார் ஓகே ஓகே ஐ ஐ அம் இன் ஸ்மார்ட் ஸ்கிரீன் ஒன்ஸ் தி மீட்டிங் வாஸ்கி கிவ் இன்ட்ரோடக்ஷன் ஐ வில் கோ ஆன் லைவ் ஆக்சுவலி யா யா ஓகே சார் சோ நவ ஆர் யூ ரெடி சார் டாக்டர் ஜவஹர் ஃபரூக் எஸ் எஸ் நோ ப்ராப்ளம் மை ஸ்லைட்ஸ் ஆர் விசிபிள் மூ ஐ அம் ரெடி ஓகே ஃபைன் சோ குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன் एवरी वन சோ ஆன் தி ஒகேஷன் ஆஃப் वर्ल्ड ஹார்ட் டே இட்ஸ் மை இமன்ஸ் பிளஷர் அண்ட் ப்ரைட் டு இன்வைட் டாக்டர் ஜவஹர் ஃபரூக் Actually, I know Dr. Jawar Farooq almost for the last 20 years. In fact, like, sir is, the, uh, is one of the reasons for me to pursue a career in cardiology. So, actually, I'm following his footsteps. So, when I was doing my DNB general medicine, sir was my teacher. And he was doing his cardiology at that time. So, we used to have a lot of interactions with them. So, which actually instilled a lot of interest in the field of cardiology. So, later, I went on to do cardiology like him. then after completing cardiology i followed him like doing a uh, fellowship in interventional cardiology so under his guidance and mentorship i have been following him so it's a, a great moment for me like to have him as a guest lecturer on this wonderful day and dr farooq is a great acad- academician and as well as he's a philanthropist so he was actually uh, trained in the madras medical mission as an interventional cardiologist and uh, though he had lot of options to work in uh, very big corporate hospitals in chennai he actually wanted to move to romna to serve the people over there so he has been doing an immense service and even during the time of covid he has actually extended a great help to the society over there and to the lot of people who actually cannot be you know who cannot access to the cardiological care so as a super specialist and as well as a trained interventionist he is providing uh, the utmost care to the patients in the regions of ramnath so and as well 
He's got a great interest in Tamil literature. So recently has been awarded a doctorate in uh, Tamil literature uh, by the university. And uh, with this introduction, without not, uh, without not taking much time, I would like to invite Dr. Farooq to start his presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope I am audible, Dr. Baski. Yes, sir, audible. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, the Vengadeswara Medical College faculty, for giving me such a wonderful opportunity. I would like to uh, thank uh, the Dean, Professor Dr. Ratnasamy, Dean Dr. Mahadevan, and the Medical Superintendent Dr. Vinod Prem Singh, and also my good friend, one of the greatest academician and greatest student I have seen, a well qualified and skilled interventional cardiologist, which is an asset and boon to the city of Pondicherry. And uh, he is not only a student, he is a teacher for excellence, actually. He can corner any, any examiner at any point of time, even during the final examination. Such a wonderful, knowledgeable, skilled, the uh, very dogmatic in subject, Dr. Baskaran. And he, I think he is one of the more most qualified, only qualified interventional cardiologist of, of Pondicherry. And uh, uh, I'm very happy that uh, Vengadeshwara Medical College is having such a wonderful asset and great teacher at this uh, middle of his career, actually. I wish him all the best for further growth to go to the global level as one of the best interventions in cardiology, doing structural intervention and imaging physiology, and also whatever field is uh, expert on and exhibiting all his knowledge and presenting a lot of paper. Thank you very much, Dr. Baski. And uh, I am uh, very much thankful to all the faculty members for joining today evening. And it's my great pleasure to wish all you a happy World Heart Day, happy and healthy World Heart Day. Thank you very much for using this important topic. As you know, the prevalence and etiology of heart failure in India, the prevalence of heart failure ranges from 1.3 to 4.6 million with the annual incidence of around 0.5 to 1.8. The incident hospital. Look at this. The Indian counterpart is lesser age, lower ejection fraction, death rate is very high, 5 to 6 total admission to the household, re hospitalization rate also is very high, and post discharge, you can look at it actually. They come with this uh, re hospitalization uh, death after the uh, post discharge. Is 26.3 percent compared to 5, 5 to 15 percent in U U.S. and Europe. The uncontrolled hypertension and ischemic heart disease are the dreaded killer and key target population developing heart failure in India. If you look at main of three main causes of the hospitalization due to the chronic heart failure, or you can look at the ischemia, sodium retention, and arrhythmia. The acute decompensated heart failure basically is leading cause of hospital admission. In emergency room, Dr. Boski will agree with me, patient older than 65 years, even a younger patient, they frequently admitted with the diagnosis of acute decompensated heart failure. It is one of the commonest causes of admission due to dyspnea. So these hospitalizations are highly risky and associated with very poor outcome, including the rehospitalization and death. The management of acute decompensated heart failure is drastically different from chronic heart failure, as the inpatient treatment consists of primarily hemodynamic stabilization, symptom relief, and prevention of short-term morbidity and mortality. That should be our aim for acute decompensated heart failure compared to chronic heart failure, where we think about the preventing uh, the hospital admission, rehospitalization, and maintaining a stable symptom-free status, actually. So how are the Indian the heart failure patients are different? The overall incidence is likely to increase in future owing to the uh, risk factors like aging population, Rising, tremendously rising incidence of coronary artery disease prevalence, epidemic rise of diabetes and hypertension, persistence of disease such as rheumatic heart disease, which is not a problem in Western counterpart, and untreated congenital heart disease. We all see in the outpatient department, the adult ASD, VSD, PDAs, and even a complex congenital heart disease, which is untreated, are very common in Indian sub uh, the subsets compared to the Western counterpart. How are these Indian patients are very much different because they suffer heart failure in younger age. The male to female ratios are different, 70 is to 30. Rheumatic heart disease is still a major contributor. Diabetes is more prevalent among Indian. They behave worst in Indian sub subsets. 
the prognosis of heart failure in indian patients are appear to be worse than those in western counterpart and strike the patient at the prime of their life that is most important in india they come with young heart failure i have seen many patients who are coming at the age of 30 40 with a complicated heart failure yesterday i have seen one patient with 40 with ejection fraction of 10% in class 4 symptom actually so how does this heart failure clinical course occurs this look at this heart failure we have a clinical decompensation this is very important to understand to manage the therapy actually this is also important when you take a ward rounds actually this is most important we also we have to recognize the early phase clinical decompensation which is the early acute phase they can go into late acute phase the red zone we look at it actually these are the dangerous zone they, they can go into late acute phase and uh, the, this this phase is a discharge coordination at which point you deescalate the, the parenteral therapy to the oral therapy this is the transition zone this is most important this we need to evolve it. most of most of us actually we think that we establish the patient that is the reason for rehospitalization they may have a metabolic abnormality mild renal insufficiency uncorrected they may have an elevated uh, the troponin or elevated bnp pro bnp level or the ecg change is persisting actually or they may have a untreated or the occult infection which is there uncorrected anemia this is all contributing to a rehospitalization the transition to oral therapy need a evaluation for long term trajectory actually so this is the optimization phase our aim is to have this early post discharge phase very stable and also the follow up very stable and during the follow up also we need to evaluate them the response to therapy during this period look at this actually our aim is to start and optimize guidelines directed medical therapy which has a definite benefit actually that is most important in this trajectory so once you treat the acute decompensated heart failure you always look for initiating the guidelines directed medical therapy which has a long term benefit actually so this is the heart failure is leads to a frequent hospitalization it is the most common cause of hospitalization patient age more than 65 years nearly 44% of heart failure patients are readmitted for any cause within one year after discharge you look at the length of stay of hospitalization ranges between 5 to 10 days many of the studies have shown that actually the length increases as they get readmitted that is most important and when they have a frequent readmission that means they are not responding to therapy that means that the prognosis is very bad actually in united state of america the 30 day readmission rate is around more than 25% in europe the readmission rates are around 24% at 12 weeks in india the readmission is somewhere around 30 to 40% you are getting a, the discharge the come back again that increases the cost of therapy and also outcome is very poor so why are this patient get readmitted that is most important this question is most important in acute decompensated heart failure management they have an uncorrected arrhythmia they have an ongoing acute coronary syndrome ischemia hypotension worsening renal function and the heart failure within heart failure they may have a heart failure uncorrected anemia aggravating another heart failure actually or any of the high output state existing causes of high output state ex- existing contributing for heart failure actually apart from that <coughs> the systemic factor like inadequate follow up inadequate discharge planning the the medication issues non optimal dose the patient factor like non adherence with medication diet fluid restriction which is very important in, the, in india they don't get complaint to this fluid restriction they don't restrict the uh, the salt because our population is genetically salt craving population genetically salt craving population we eat salted food actually there is the most important reason patient get readmitted in spite of optimized medication failure to seek medical attention when symptom recur poor health literacy and failed social support and economic support there are the reason for heart failure readmission actually so what are the goal of therapy goal of therapy for the heart failure is the primordial goal is to mitigate symptoms and signs prevent the first hospital admission and subsequent readmission and improve the survival as well as quality of life you have to reduce the mortality you have to uh, optimize the medication dose you have to reduce the all cause hospitalization you have to reduce the hospitalization related to the heart failure and improve the quality of life so this is what is most important key discharge is the start of journey <clears throat> as you see the acute heart failure the presentation to the hospital initiate the short term infusion earlier in hospital you continue the short term infusion earlier as you monitor the hospitalized patient actually pre discharge you target the vulnerable phase you have to target the vulnerable phase to initiate therapy during hospitalization for the long term use actually 
to go into this chronic heart failure state, stable chronic heart failure state, the preventary admission, two weeks to months post discharge and chronic heart failure status actually. What are the criteria for admission from the emergency department? This is one of the criteria which has been the, uh, put forward by the Heart Failure Society of America. You look at this recommended heart, uh, the admission or you have to admit them if they are hypotensive, worsening renal function, altered mental status when they are having a dyspnea at rest, when they have hemodynamically significant arrhythmia or when they have an acute coronary syndrome. You have to consider the admission when they have worsening congestion, major electrolyte disturbances, especially hyponatremia, comorbid condition which is associated with heart, heart failure like uncontrolled diabetes, when they have an obesity or uncontrolled hypertension, repeated or COPD patients actually, repeated ICD firing uh, or the device which is not working, this become uh, most important when they are on device for a refractory heart failure or previously undiagnosed heart failure, if you want to diagnose them actually or whether there is heart failure is contributing for his present symptom because sometimes you may have the COPD and heart failure together, 44% of the people have been studied in one of the reports from BMJ, they have together actually, sometimes the COPD exaggerate, sometimes heart failure exaggerate. So you have to identify which is the cause to treat them <coughs> adequately during the present admission. This is important for a clinical assessment. <coughs> you have to label them into four subgroups actually. So you have to assess the congestion, you have to uh, assess the perfusion. But as a clinician, you have to, how do you assess the con congestion? There are parameters, you have to have clinical parameter. Use the, uh, if, if they have orthopnea, <coughs> they may have a pulmonary congestion. They may have bentopnea, the orthopnea reflects that they have elevated diastolic pressure or elevated LV pulling pressure. The bentopnea is other terminology is being used. This basically occurs when there is elevated RV and LV filling pressure, when they have a raised JVP, when they have a bibasilar uh, the uh, rolls, when they have an edema, when they have an, uh, the ascites, when they have a tender hepatomegaly, when they have uh, abdominal jugular reflexes, that is very common. To, you can see them, uh, this is, when it is positive, that means they have a congestion actually, or when they have an indirect measure of pulmonary artery pressure which is elevated, or when they have parameters like BNP or pro-BNP is a, a very much elevated. These are all the features suggest that patient is having a congestion. You assess the congestion. If they have a congestion, yes. If they don't have a congestion, they are dry actually. If they have a congestion, it is wet actually. How do you assess the perfusion? The perfusion is assessed very much clinically by looking at periphery, very cold actually, or the pulse pressure. Pulse pressure also will be narrow. Peri per perfusion is poor means they are, pulse pressure is very much narrow. And the, they may have an uptended state or they have frequently they are going for a drowsy state or altered sensorium. And when they, they, they may have a hyponatremia or they may have a decreased urine output or they may have a uh, the, uh, the, uh, pre renal acetremia or uh, the elevated urea creatinine. These are all suggest that the perfusion is bad actually. So classify them to initiate the therapy whether they are warm or dry or whether they are warm or wet whether they are cold or dry or cold or wet. This is what important to uh, to initiate which form of a therapy, whether you are increasing the perfusion by using an inotrophic agent or you want decongesting them, this is most important. And among the substrate, you can prognosticate them actually. Cold and wet, they have a pulmonary edema with cardiogenic, uh, the, uh, cardiogenic salt. These are the subgroup of people, they behave very badly actually because you want, may not be able to use this, some of the agents like diuretic very liberally in this subgroup of people. So the, the, the congestive state will keep prolonging. The only option is to improve the output using an, uh, the inotrophic agent or a mechanical circulatory supports actually. So this is this is what is clinical trajectory for acute decompensated heart failure. This You can look at this actually. This may have, <coughs> the patient may have uh, improving towards the target with adequate decongestion. They may be hemodynamically stable with no uh, complication. So you have to continue. And uh, transition to oral therapy is advisable in this group of people. You have to continue towards decongestion and plan for tra tra transition to oral therapy. If on track to reach the decongestion target, consider the step towards achieving a goal-directed medical therapy and address the goals of care and educate the patient and they address the comorbid scenarios. In second group, initial improvement will be there and then get stalled. Then you have to escalate all this therapy. That means you are not responding to this therapy you have started actually. So consider high dose diuretic in this, add on to second diuretic in optimis, I add on metalazone in this individual and other strategy with IV vasodilator like nitroprusate, nitroglycine may be considered. 
to reduce cost load and consider invasive hemodynamic assessment to ascertain diagnosis review any recent medications we see them some of them they coming with the the exaggeration of heart failure not responding on nsaids like steroids and you also uh, look at some of this uh, the competing diagnosis you what underlying diagnosis it can be an obstructive problem or it can be a structural problem you not have been detected previously like valvular diseases they may not respond to medical therapy so you have to consult the cardiology heart failure specialist and readdress the call of therapy and consider the palliative care if appropriate actually the third group of patient they not improve at all worsening inadequate congestion with low cardiac output worsening end organ damage in this you have to escalate and consider a therapies and goals of a care you have to consider escalating diuretic as a decongestion strategy consider hemodynamic monitoring and right heart catheterization inotrope and pressure agents in a strengthen those high doses you can consider it actually consider percutaneous and durable mechanical devices support are uh, the electrical devices what we use today with uh, crt and all the devices which are available consider uh, the long term advanced treatment strategy and cardiac transplant you, you have a heart team in your hospital you can consult with the surgeons possibility of having a donor and sending them for heart transplant we evaluate the comorbidity and alternative diagnosis seek additional expertise like cardiology advanced heart failure team consider palliative care you are not able to do with their morbid situations these are the therapeutic algorithm for a symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as you patient with symptomatic heart failure the major form of a therapy here the as inhibitor beta blocker still symptomatic is less than 30% you have to add on mineral caustic acid and agonin still uh, symptomatic with elevated of 35% you can switch over to arni and when they are sinus rhythm qrs duration is more than 130 evaluate the need for a cardiac resynchronization therapy this is one of the thing which is very useful when they have eight qrs heart failure and sinus rhythm is low more than 70 beats per minute you can put them on evaporated this about treatment may be combined as indicated resistance symptom you can put them on the added agents like digoxin in this group of patient only digoxin may be useful especially when they have atrial fibrillation you can use the vasodilator or plan for an elvad or the you can plan for a heart transplant advise them in their younger age and if they are not responding no further action is required during this course symptomatic relief can be achieved using a diuretic as soon as the decongestion is achieved you have to deescalate the diuretic and reduce the, it doesn't have any mortality benefit at all actually this is all you, you got to time the drug and devices and intervention in heart failure as a clinical course <clears throat> major form of a therapy today is called foundation 4 today is been added with the european society of cardiology arni beta blocker mineral cardiac antagonist and sgl2 inhibitor these are the two you have now the onset of congestive heart failure and to prevent the sudden cardiac death you can consider uh, the implantable cardioverter defibrillator or cardiac reconstruction therapy when they have a, a acute heart failure you evaluate the cause of a decompensation the arrhythmia is one of the cause for recurrent decompensation in that scenario you can consider treating this uh, afib like conditions invasively and <coughs> advanced heart failure the steep deteriorate once they keep deteriorating pump failure you have to consider this advanced treatment like mechanical circulatory devices ventricular assist devices and transplant actually what are the evidence based pharmacology the di- loop diuretic all acute decompensation heart failure you can put them on intravenous uh, the loop diuretic dose trial and adherent trial has shown this actually but there is no difference within the intermittent dose versus the continuous infusion it is your option and you have to add on to this uh, loop diuretic when they become diuretic resistance and they achieve a maximum dose in another diuretic like thiazide diuretic in metalazone we have some of the studies and guidelines have suggested that actually as inhibitor arb <coughs> you have to use it for all the patients and you should not combine arb rn or as inhibitor together that's that is very important caution is to you have to evaluate them for hypotension and uh, there are many trials for arb is a many trial for as inhibitor rn is a new agent which has been come around like this is a wonderful benefit now at present even during the commercial heart failure and sacrobital valsartan this has been studied in paradigm heart failure trial apart from that it is also been studied in many of the acute commercial heart failure inotropic agents are used in cardiogenic shock when they have severe systolic systolic dysfunction with hypotension decreased cardiac output you can consider dopamine or dopamine five mix actually optim chf and escape trial so shown the uh, hydrolysis isotope dinitrate has been used as a vasodilator as in a refractory heart failure status and uh, the analogs of bnp and uh, nitrates uh, nesiritide which is one which is failed now at present actually but it can be considered in refractory status actually vasopressin i want to use them <coughs> the uh, aquaretic aquaretic is a tolvaptan which is used 15 mg daily in everest trail actually very useful 
especially when they are in a volume overloaded state, when they have a hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, congestive heart failure, the toloptan is very, very much useful. Beta blocker is other evidence based. <coughs> we have three beta blocker, metaprolol, the bisoprolol, and carbidiolol. Many trials have come, beta blocker benefit, which is one of the, the, the foundation for uh, drug therapy, which need to be used just after decongestion. Evaporating is other agent when the heart rate remains more than 70, which has been studied in SIFT trial, actually. So, with the core form of a therapy for heart failure, we have a AC inhibitor, a ARB, we have mineral particular antagonist, beta blocker, we have a loop diuretic. When they are become resistant to diabetic, you can uh, diuretic and add metalazone. You, uh, you cannot be able to achieve the heart rate less than 70. You have a evaporating as an option. Meantime, you have to look at adding digoxin in a symptomatic patient. And especially when the people are having an, uh, the atrial fibrillation, it may be beneficial here actually. But this is one agent. IV ion is another agent which has been, a lot of paper has been published on the, uh, published on, uh, the European Society of Cardiology. You look at this and serum ferritin is less than 100. Evaluate them actually. Transparent saturation is less than 20%. You can add an IV ion therapy. And when they are in a thrombogenic state, high risk of developing stroke or in atrial fibrillation, you have to consider oral anticoagulant. When they have a coronary artery disease ischemia, you have to add an antiplatelet and statin actually. These are the, the positive trials for drug and device trials for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction going into decompensated state. We have... The, all the, the devices, the isocyphid diet, vasodilator, mineral receptor, antagonist, beta blocker, surgery, army, angiotensin receptor blocker, evaporating, implantable cardiovascular defibrillator, we have in evidence. La the latest evidence is for HGL2 inhibitor, DAPA HR trials or so on. It is very much beneficial in reducing the morbidity mortality, especially reducing the hospital readmission, the hospitalization due to re hospitalization due to heart failure, actually. For even for the surgeries, we have stitch trial, Hotman trial, rematch trial, <coughs> devices, <coughs> we have companion trial, SCD hub trial, CARE HF trial, MADIT CRT trial, RAF trial. These are all a wonderful trial which has been done as an evidence to prove that this will be useful in this refractory status actually. ARNI is a paradigm shift in management of heart failure. It is a novel treatment. Sacrobatal wells are a shown block renin angiotensin system. Look at this dual action actually. We know that actually the angiotensinogen, angiotensin 2 is the strongest potent vasoconstrictor. By blocking it, it reduces the blood pressure, sympathetic tone, adestone level and the cardiac fibrosis and hypertrophy. Natriuretic peptide system is the other one which basically has been depleted by neprilysin. By blocking the neprilysin, we have this vasodilatory peptide which reduces the blood pressure, sympathetic tone, re reduces the understood level, cardiac fibrosis and hypertrophy. And also it achieves the natriuresis actually. Apart from that, it blocks the bradykinin pathway and decreases the blood pressure, improves this nitric oxide level and increases the natriuresis. This is a wonder drug now which has come actually, which has been studied in Pioneer Heart Failure Trial. The Pioneer Heart Failure Trial, they have shown this actually, they randomized the people <coughs> with heart failure in a screening period, Stabilized with the, with the patients with heart, the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. They have a sacrobatal well sat on the enalapiril arm for eight weeks, escalating dosage of a sacrobatal well sat on the, the enalapiril, de escalating the escalating doses of enalapiril. At the end of eight weeks, they have changed, switched over to sacrobatal arm. Now look at this, switched over to sacrobatal arm for eight to 12 weeks actually. And uh, the randomization has been done uh, at least for 48 hours after the hospital presentation. And trial duration is 12 weeks actually. The primary endpoints is looking at the change in the NT pro BRP level. Baseline, sacrobatal wells are done, the NT pro BRP comes down drastically low and sustained low actually. Apart from that, the serious composite clinical endpoint like death, heart failure, recarpalization, L ward, transplant testing comes down by 46% in a sacrobatal wells are done arm actually. Such a wonderful drug, it helps to reduce these people going in for device requirement. That is what is one of the electrophysiologists, I told them actually the device therapy, the requirement has come down drastically after the usage of these drugs, this sacrobatal valsartan actually. So this sacrobatal valsartan reduces the rehospitalization with statistical significance. In pioneer heart failure trial actually. It has a safety outcome. Look at the safety outcome. It doesn't produce much with the worsening of renal function, hyperkalemia, or symptomatic hypertension, angiotensin, angioedema, Compared to enalapril, some of them may tolerate better than enalapril actually. So there is no significant difference in adverse outcome in the sacrobatal valsartan group actually. Among the patients who have been hospitalized for acute decompensated heart failure, 
The initiation of sacrobutyl alt cell therapy resulted in greater reduction in the antiproinflammatory concentration, reduction in the hospitalization for the heart failure, well tolerated with comparable rates of renal insufficiency, hyperkalemia, symptomatic hypotension, and angioedema. So you initiate this nephrolysis inhibitor. You look at this actually in the, the, the final heart failure trial. The enlapril arm actually it always <coughs> it was remaining up. This curve was re always remaining up. The antipropylene was coming down actually. As we switch over to sacrobutyl arm, you look, it becomes same actually. This curve has become same actually. That means sacrobutyl is very much uh, the helpful. Uh, the enlapril doesn't produce that much reduction in the antiproBNP, which is the prognostic marker in heart failure, actually. So, this pioneer heart failure trial, sacrobutyl valsartan, is associated with further decrease in the antiproBNP natriuretic peptide level compared with the enlapril arm. It produces a persistent, the, also the continuous decongestion in the patients, actually, improving the morbidity and mortality. The transition trial, the transition trial is whether you can initiate the sacrobutyl valsartan, in a hospital patient with acute decompensated heart failure with reduced ejection fraction after the hemodynamic stabilization. <coughs> These trials have shown that actually the primary endpoint, they looked at the achieving a maximum dose and sustaining a permanently most maximum dose with preventing a dis discontinuation. They did not have much difference in a safety outcome. They did not have a, a, any, any higher incidence, statistically higher incidence of hyperkalemia, hypotension, are the atrial fibrillation VT in this group actually? They are well tolerated, better than the enlapril arm actually. So, initiation of sacrobutyl valve sartan shortly after hospitalization for acute decompensed heart failure, the patient with a newly diagnosed uh, transition study, the primary endpoint of tolerability has been assessed. Secondary endpoint whether you could be able to uh, put, them, uh, put this drug on uh, the de novo heart failure and whether you could be able to sustain for a longer period of time. So, the primary endpoint, uh, like uh, your target dose achievement, achieving and sustaining was better when she initiated the DNO heart failure as an initial drug, first line drug in acute decompensated state. So, after the acute decompensated heart failure, the first line initiation of sacrobutyl valsartan, <coughs> DNO, HFRF, alongside the initiation of other guidelines directed therapy is feasible and associated with better risk benefit profile than in patient with prior HFRF actually. So, early initiation. Intervention with sacrobutyl valsartan may be considered to uh, delay the disease progression in a patient with genoma have as a replacement to AC inhibitor ARB to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and death in ambulatory patient. The initiation of sacrobutyl valsartan rather than AC inhibitor ARB may be considered for patient hospitalized with new onset heart failure and decompensated congestive heart failure to reduce the short-term risk of adverse event to, and to simplify the management, to avoid the need to titrate AC inhibitor and uh, you can switch over and you can achieve maximum doses actually. So how do you achieve the congestion? This is most important. This is another question. We have it in the, in the ward rounds actually. How do you achieve the congestion? Congestion can be achieved in the, the first six hours, early evaluation phase. You evaluate them. After two hours, you look for this the spot urine output, uh, the urine sodium analysis, or average urine output. If sodium so, sodium spot sodium is 5 to 7 milli equivalent per liter, or 6 hour urine output is more than 100 to 100 ml per hour, then uh, you have to, uh, you, you, you have, you, if there is a persistent congestion, if it is no persistent congestion with this level, you can continue the same dosage actually. If there is a persistent con congestion, you can repeat similar dose of IV due priority every 12 hours actually. But if there is uh, no increase in the urine output or if there is no say, suggestion that the sodium is removed, the spot sodium is not increased, that means the diuretic is not adequate, you have to double the dose of IV loop diuretic and uh, you assess within three, the, the six hours and if you, you to do the same thing actually, look for the urine output and spot sodium and if it is not uh, happening there actually, we could, able to, could not able to achieve adequate ur urine output, then you can repeat the until maximum dose of loop diuretic you achieved. Or you're not able to achieve even with that, actually, you could go to the second start when they have a persistent condition, actually. The second day of admission, evaluate 24 hours urine output. 24 hours urine output is more than 3 to 4 liters, then con continue the current dose until the decongestion, actually. You could not able to achieve the, the 3 to 4 liter, double the uh, loop diuretic to the maximum dose, and uh, assess, you can add on another diuretic in this individual, whether you can add metalazone, diazide, or amyloride. So that 
you can maintain the good urine output at spot sodium. Uh, the, the, the chart will be very useful when they are not responding. The chart is also to give a, a guideline saying that this is how you act when the patient is not responding, assess the response to the diuretic therapy. The comorbidity in the heart failure patient, alarmingly, more than half of the heart failure population have two co chronic comorbidity. Most have at least one comorbidity. The prospect of observational studies have shown that the CKD, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, anemia are most prevalent comorbidity. Also, patients with CKD, diabetes, anemia, they have associated increased risk of morbidity and mortality. The diabetes, they have bidirectional impact. Diabetic can alter the fatty acid, free fatty acid metabolism, impair myositoid calcium sensitivity, microvascular dysfunction, neurohormonal abnormality, they can produce cardiac autonomic dysfunction, they can produce hypodermic cellular damage, they can produce structural changes in the LV, they can decrease the LV contractility, relaxation, fibrosis, LVH, myonecrosis, endothelial dysfunction, altered myositoid me 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 metabolism, this in turn leading on to myopathy, heart failure, that heart failure per se can produce, aggravate the insulin resistance, hyperthalemia, this cycle, <coughs> this, this became a vicious cycle actually. AGLT inhibitor is a new pro promising agent in type 2 diabetes with heart failure. It removes the body fluid, decreases the volume overload, decreases the uh, BP. It is foundation for therapy now at present the established agent in diabetic, without diabetic. It has a novel mechanism of fluid shift, removes the fluid. It doesn't produce a significant hypovolemia compared to diuretic. It has the neurohumoral uh, endocrine mediated effect actually. It has an uh, impact over the removing interstitial fluid out. It has an impact over the cardiac remodeling. It also has an impact over this ROS mechanism, increased hematocrit actually. So the, the ADA and uh, the EASD, is, they have shown that actually if you want to prevent the heart failure, the best agent is AGLT inhibitor. If you want to prevent the progression of uh, the CKD, the best agent here is the AGLT inhibitor with reduction in the morbidity and mortality and prevent uh, the hospital readmission. This agent prevent uh, a hospital readmission. So, 2016, empagliflozin should be considered in type 2 diabetic to prevent uh, the onset of heart failure. In 2019, it has become a heart failure medication. In 2021, it has become a foundation for one of the therapy should be initiated very early along with the army. The Emparag outcome trial has shown that actually we have these three trials for Empa, Cana and uh, Tapagliflozin with significant mortality benefit. They have reduction in the significant mortality and hospital admission. DAPA HF trials have shown the primary composite endpoint like CV death, heart failure hospitalization, urgent heart failure the visit, and uh, all cause death actually, quality of life, the worsening heart failure events have been much, 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 much lower in a patient in a SGL with arm. So, among the patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, the risk of <coughs> worsening heart failure and death from a Cardiovascular cost was lower among those who received apoglyphlosin than among those people who received placebo, regardless of presence or absence of diabetes. Hyperkalemia for the potassium abnormalities are very common in heart failure. This hyperkalemia, we can see it in resistant hypertension. For us, diabetic, when they have a, the ketoacidosis or when they are on medications, when they are associated with renal dysfunction, we have to be very careful to assess this hyperkalemia. In this, uh, you, uh, studies have shown that actually patients with heart failure who are having a high risk of developing hyperkalemia are old age, low body mass index, the uncontrolled diabetes, COPD, peripheral artery disease, CKD, current smoking and mineral receptor antagonist therapy. The average, the potassium uh, value in a patient with heart failure, serum potassium 3.5, 9% of individual, serum potassium more than 5 in 36%, more than 5.5 in 13%, and more than 6 in 4% actually. So, hyperkalemia is an inherent risk in treatment of heart failure with ROS inhibitor. The RAS trials have shown, RAS trial, FECIS trial, emphasis heart failure trials are done in the, the aldosterone antagonist, receptor antagonist actually, it produces the potassium retention. These trials have shown 13% of the people in RAS trial had potassium more than 5.5 millimole per liter, 16% in emphasis trial, 12% in emphasis trial, they had more than 5.5 millimole per liter. Basically, as you all know, this, this agent retains the potassium. The aldosterone is blocked with retain the potassium, actually. So, the maximum RAS inhibitor, it reduces this uh, incidence of mortality. So, the, the maximizing RAS inhibitors are very much essential in a patient with CKD. 
the patient with diabetes in total population could able to maximize them actually monitoring the potassium it reduces the amount max achieving a maximum dose is very very important when you want to have consideration of long term prolongation of guideline directed medical therapy so the risk of hyperkalemia during heart refer patient with the mineral cardiac and the use of sacobacterial wells are as we assessed compared to enalapril more people on enalapril they have higher risk of developing hyperkalemia but sacobacterial wells are on lesser number of people had this this has been proved in the paradigm heart failure trial so sacobacterial wells are on is better tolerated with mineral receptor antagonists like all the aldacron than the enalapril actually so what do you do this the expert uh, expert recommendation on monitoring treating hyperkalemia if they are chronic or recurrent hyperkalemia you have to monitor them look at this dose the level actually 5 is uh, 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 it is more than 5 you closely monitor them meantime you continue this uh, medication monitoring them actually we can very very dangerously high then you have to stop them you have to use this potassium lowering agents see any any of the situation the potassium lowering agents like loop diuretic will be very useful as an adjunct in controlling the potassium or lowering the potassium but the monitoring is very very important and assessing them whether they going to the any status which can increase the potassium the renal failure is more important when you are considering the treatment of hyperkalemia so hypokalemia and hyperkalemia are the most important parameter they can have an impact over the heart failure outcome loop and thiazide diuretic reduces the potassium ac inhibitor arb mineral receptor antagonist increase the potassium amylorate and triamtin are sometimes used as an adjunctive diuretic and resistant edema to assist preventing hypokalemia so this the, the treatment of hypokalemia can involve the recommended high potassium diet and the prescribing potassium supplementation previously but the potassium conserving agents like ac inhibitor arb now we don't advise them actually because this will the one, one one this drugs will increase the potassium and loop diuretic remove the potassium from the body actually the two agents adjunctive they have an action of maintaining an normal potassium actually iron deficiency is associated with increased mortality but iron deficiency is different from iron deficiency anemia iron deficiency per se can have an impact actually this has been studied <coughs> with looking at uh, the transferrin saturation when they are high low hepcidin hepcidin is when it become low actually iron binding molecule is low actually so this mortality increases tremendously even in the absence of uh, the anemia so the recommendation as of now is to assess their the hemoglobin status assess their urea creatinine status also you assess along with this glucose and lipid profile also you assess the total iron binding capacity and serum ferritin level actually so you have to early detect this all the patient with heart failure you should be screened for iron deficiency and early detect this iron deficiency when serum ferritin is less than 100 nanogram per ml or serum ferritin is 100 to 200 229 nanogram per ml when transferrin saturation is less than 20% that need to be corrected with peri carboxyl maltose intravenous iron therapy will be useful and uh, to correct this it is a class 2a recommendation with the level of evidence a actually and people have shown this in a randomized control trial this is very much helpful in preventing a heart failure readmission and reducing the heart failure mortality the novel consideration optimizing a case patient care for heart failure we have to initiate initiate and switch optimize and get into this gold line guideline directed uh, medical therapy titrate them actually to achieve a max- maximal dosage consider referral when you could not able to achieve decongestion when they become refractory you have to have a care coordination and you have to improve the adherence the specific patient cohort had to be identified and corrected actually cost of care has to be optimized uh, so that they become more compliant increase the comp- complexity and the various target has to be identified comorbid situations has to be corrected you always look for a palliative hospital care hospital care in a refractory state the gaps between guidelines and real life is lack of awareness in general population lack of access to natriuretic peptide testing need a better training of heart failure patient with implementation of heart medicine program need a better education and under optimization of drug regime under adherence to guidelines and access to heart failure center or cardiac rehabilitation program is not much especially we do not have good heart failure program is going on the reason for my heart failure mortality take a message to angreshwara medical college given me a wonderful opportunity today world heart day heart failure is increasingly prevalent syndrome is a leading cause of both first hospitalization and the readmission our novel paradigm approach is needed to improve the current prognosis of acute common cell heart failure 
both improving the survival and reducing the hospitalizations are therefore the primordial uh, therapy goals actually how we approaches like survival goals are easier to be inhibitor very complex molecules here the remer emerging uh, drugs reduce the hospitalization you always and our support for the care and advocacy thank you very much for giving an opportunity now we have one question to mota pesa savannah solting anega poi kulichittu or aaru minute padra aaru kan ye minute ஒரே <laughs> uh on latest medications and as well as the interventional therapies now more patients with cardiac disease are living actually so what it eventually turns out to be a major chunk of patients living with cardiac problems so previously patients with coronary artery disease patients with valvular heart disease their mortality was very high but now so we do, we do have like now the primary angioplasty now the interventional uh, treatment for coronary artery disease have improved a lot and as well the valvular intervention and as well as the surgical management of the valvular heart disease have improved a lot so this improvement in the treatment strategies now a lot of patients are living with cardiac disease so eventually all these patients will land up in heart failure will go on develop to uh, heart failure so in our clinical practice we do see many patients presenting with heart failure and these heart failure patients as dr faruk was stressing up has to be critically assessed and managed properly so i would like to stress upon two things previously we have been having all this conventional therapies like as we all know like diuretics ac inhibitors beta blockers and the nerlocorticoid receptor antagonists but now the two medications really is going to be a, a game changer one is the orni that is angiotensin receptor blocker with the naproxen inhibitor sacubitril with valsartan in combination and the other one is the sodium glucose co transport inhibitors like glufosinus so actually in my practice like uh, any patient with heart failure unless uh, due to any other reason i am not able to start on orni otherwise i straight away start this patients on angiotensin receptor blockers with the naproxen inhibitor and uh, only one uh, thing of caution which i would like to insist is that please make sure these patients are not on any ac inhibitors or arb for at least the previous 72 hours that is like previous 3 days because patients who are already on ac inhibitor arb if you start on orni then this patients chance of developing a first dose hypotension and hyperkalemia is quite significant so that one thing which we should always keep it in mind and recently i had a patient uh, around 6 to 7 months back she had a very severe lv dysfunction so this patient was uh, put on uh, orni and uh, and actually whenever i initiate on this uh, orni i always go with 25 mg twice daily then i slowly up to it most often the problem that baski you lost thank you many of the department faculty members they have any discussion or question sir sorry i just lost the connection yeah you can restart now at present actually there is a wonderful point we mentioned actually one you are very very cautious when starting a So uh, this year, Arni, yeah. Arni, you told about or some important point. This should not be on ACN inhibitor AR, ARB, and you should not combine with them. Actually, you have to make sure that uh, they come out of this ACN inhibitor, ACN inhibition before the, before initiating is Arni. Wonderful point, actually. And uh, we were mentioning about uh, the recent heart failure classification. Actually, the heart failure, one of the heart failure classification. Now it has been put forward. Is no. we classify according to the ejection fraction i have talked about f ref f ref when you say that that means ejection fraction should be less than 40% less than equal to 40% when they have uh, preserved ejection fraction have f ref 
when they have ejection fraction more than equal to 50%. In between that, we have mid-range ejection fraction, or now they use the terminology called mildly reduced LV, LV function. That is LV systolic function. They don't use the mid-range now at present. Mildly reduced LV systolic function is when the ejection fraction is in between 40 to 50%. We have evidences for these drugs the, the, in the HEFPREF, actually. The HEFPREF, basically, the not much studies have undergone, uh, done in this molecule, actually. The HEFPREF, you have to only modify the, uh, the risk, risk factor, but sometimes prognostically they behave very badly, like especially when they have a, the uncontrolled hypertension or when they have renal diseases. HEFPREF also, they do they behave very ba badly, like HEFPREF, actually. So in this individual, the main important thing is we identify the cause of this uh, heart failure with reduced size. More, one of the main, major important causes is hypertension and hypertrophic disorders. Hypertrophic, that need to be identified and treated actually. Basti, you are mute actually. You have to... You are on mute. Exactly, sir. Yeah. This this particular lady whom I have shot on this orny, now I have just... Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we are audible. Uh, go on. Sir, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bhaskar. Again mute, again mute. It's quite a... Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, now... Yeah. Okay. So the other drug is this uh, deflosins. So initially it was like introduced as a diabetic drug with a uh, better cardiovascular profile. Now uh, it has been uh, proved in many studies that even without diabetes, with heart failure patients, we can actually you know start this deflosins and that uh, actually reduces the heart failure uh, hospitalizations and hosp uh, heart failure outcomes. So these two drugs are the drugs which we are the game changers which we need to look in the future. And as well, the other thing is that about the interventions now which are available in the management of heart failure. So intervention is not only for coronary artery disease, not all, uh, and also for the heart failure management like uh, uh, like uh, this uh, cardiac resynchronization therapies. Then now we have got this mechanical circulatory uh, devices like VATS, LVATS. And as well, uh, the heart failure uh, program has reached the transplant, heart transplantation has taken up in a very... Uh, uh, well mannered. So all these things are coming in a bigger way for the management of heart failure patients, actually. So I just like to have uh, your experience with regard to this ORNI drugs. Like how like how frequently do you use this ORNI? Like do you use it as a default drug, or what is your strategy in uh, using this drug? I initiated uh, people who are on uh, AC inhibitor ARB when they don't respond to AC inhibitor ARB initially. Uh, and this group of patients I started initially now, I even started this, start this drug as a first line agent even during the DNOVA heart failure actually. So only thing, okay. only pro problem, you know, we have to be very careful on a hemodynamic status actually. Your blood pressure, you have to be very, very careful, you have to monitor them. And uh, people usually tolerate actually. So there are problems now at present, whether you go to this 200 milligram BD dosage is very, very uh, not, an Indian patient, they don't tolerate it actually. So I initiate with uh, 50 milligram BD. As they tolerate, I go to the 100 milligram BD actually to achieve that dosage. That much dosage I maintain along with that actually. So one of the uh, patient who was having a, uh, the severe refractory heart failure, one patient I have an experience who has been referred from Malaysia. Actually, he was been referred to India for heart transplant evaluation. Heart transplant evaluation. That patient I started on army. Patient became all right. Ejection fraction as initial presentation was 20 percent. I do not know when he came back. It was 50 percent after three months. Yeah. They improved actually 50 percent. So I wanted to reduce, cut down the dosage. Again, this fellow came back with again heart failure. <laughs> I do not know what happened. Okay. So the, okay. um, it has not only neurohumoral mechanism actually. Basically, it reduces. It it, it acts at a cellular level. 
this molecule is a wonder wonder ma- ma- magical uh, ball magical bullet i can say actually but uh, it, it need to be used judiciously you have to identify a correct patient actually you have to you have to counsel them the complaints is most important because of some cost involvement now most of the companies they come down also actually so they tolerate extremely well this is one of the uh, the foundation for our first line drug you can, you can initiate as you decongest them inside the hospital when you know the hemodynamic status monitoring the anti anti proprioceptive which is available in on heart failure even during the dnr state i have experience with that actually they tolerate very much what is your experience yes sir that's what like uh, uh, recently i was really amazed with the amount of lvf which has been improved over this lady so i was thinking whether i was uh, dealing with a dcm or was it something like a reversible cardiomyopathy which has become now the ejection fraction is almost normal as you said it has reached around uh, 50% now so maybe like after after uh, the point which you have given maybe i would be skeptical in reducing the dose or stopping the rne in these patients actually probably we may have to continue this drug so that the whatever the benefit of this drug well, let us not interrupt and let us continue with the benefit of the drug so that's what i need to understand another thing so do you use this drug in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction i have not used very regularly when they really symptomatic when they are symptomatic when they come with congestion actually when they are hypertensive symptomatic severely hypertrophic left ventricular hypertrophy diffusely the hypokinetic ejection fraction around 50 55 some patients they use it actually they do extremely well and uh, okay, uh, as you told uh, the one of the uh, the advantage of this arni you know you can I, my re- readmission rate hospital readmission rate in my my setup is come down drastically low most of the patient i do not know they don't come with this pulmonary edema previously when they have a dilated cardiomyopathy with severe lv dysfunction when they send them home with diuretic they come back within 3 months 4 months they come back again with another episode of pulmonary edema you also agree with me that this this yes. occurs very frequently that doesn't happen somehow on arm readmission due to hospitalization doesn't happen are very very less actually most of the patient they do they remain stable asymptomatic and in an in outpatient therapy itself actually that's what is happening in my practice i don't see people getting admitted with pulmonary edema on arni very frequent the other thing with the agliflozins so right now um, for me like uh, apart from metformin if i am not able to use like agliflozins or the first line of drug if at all if the patient is a diabetic like uh, do we use agliflozins without patients with diabetes with heart failure are you yeah. using it in your practice no? yeah yeah I, i started using it even without diabetes also but i make sure that they have the borderline blood sugar not very much low like 70 80 they have blood sugar of maintaining around 100 110 at that level i use this uh, half dose nemphagliflozin 12.5 mg instead of 25 mg full dose i use the half dose uh along with uh, the other standard uh, therapy actually because yes yes put it in the guidelines now at present these are drugs four drugs are foundation four and if you do not treat with this drug actually probably i feel the heart failure treatment for modern era is wrong that's what yeah. i feel that's because true sir it has a definite mortality benefit that's what we have to look at it they have a definite evidence based mortality benefit and how often like do you come across uh, urinary tract infection when you use this drugs like is it uh, so how often do you come across sir the, the uh, you you teach them uh, genital hygiene but you have to identify this, the high risk individual urinary tract infection are very common in female patients when their genital hygiene is very very poor in uncontrolled diabetes there is very very common in this risk factor has to be addressed and uh, i have seen one one lady anaglyflozin immediately first week after initiation she came with uti apart from that i didn't see anything at all actually most of them they tolerate well okay tell them that actually genital hygiene identify the group of people female is the one risk factor uncontrolled diabetes is another risk factor actually or when they have urogenital the factors uh, which is uh, which is pre- 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 precipitating status for a U- uti in this group of patients has to be identified and they should be told about the subject 
But when you are evaluating for heart failure, is always one, one question has to be asked whether they have UTI or not. Symptoms of UTI has to be identified. Is there any other more questions from the participants? Anybody would like to discuss something or would like to clarify certain doubts from Dr. Farooq? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Shanmagapriya to deliver the vote of thanks. Sir, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank so you. I'm so happy to see you, so happy to listen to your presentation once again after a very, very long time. Thank you. So Thank you. nice to have you, sir. And uh, we would like to have this association sometime in future as well. Thank so, you. I'm always, always ready to associate with you, actually. Always happy to see you very successful, Dr. Baskar. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. So I would invite uh, Dr. Shanmugu Priya to deliver the vote of thanks. A very good afternoon to our honorable speaker, Dr. Jawahar Farooq, and respected Dr. Baskaran and the valued members of the medical fraternity. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. As famously said, it's not a matter of changing our landscape, but of changing our eyes. Thanks for changing the way we see the acute decompensated heart failure, sir and also the time of critical interventions. I, on behalf of uh, Sri Venteshwara Medical College and Hospital and the entire team of doctors, would like to extend our gratitude to our Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Far Jawahar Farooq, a senior interventional cardiologist and chairman of Jawahar Hospital, Ramanathapuram, to take, our time, take out time from his busy schedule to grace the event. And thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge on this special day. A special thanks to our dignitaries, Dr. Ratna Sami Dean, Dr. Mahadev Dean PG, Dr. Vinod Prem Singh, Medical Superintendent, Dr. Uh, Suresh Medic, Med Medical College Hospital and Research Center for providing an immense support to make the webinar successful. On that note, I would like to thank the team of doctors and other people who made the event possible. A big thanks to our participant for being with us. It's been remained a pronounced pleasure. Thank, thank you all. Have a, Have great, a great day ahead. Dr. Baskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Piano, <laughs> 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 <laughs>